Welcome to NREI's Common Area Podcast. This podcast is brought to you by the award-winning editorial staff at nreionline.com. Let's jump right into this week's podcast. Hello and welcome to the Common Area with your host, David Bodemer. Today I'm excited. I'm going to meet somebody new and that is David's guest, which is Bob Atkins. Bob has been with Atkins Company since 1985 and serves as a managing partner overseeing all facets of the firm's operations. Good morning, David. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you today? Doing fantastic. I'm, uh, I, you know, you and I spoke a little bit before the podcast. We're still quarantined. We're still uh, yep. social distancing and, and uh, all that good stuff. And, and you brought Bob on the show. Bob, I'm assuming you're not sitting there with David. You're, you're social distancing as well. That is correct. I'm uh, social distancing at home in New Jersey at the moment. All right. David, I, I, I'm so glad you brought him on. I'm going to let you take over because I've got a lot to learn here. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So how, how, uh, I think we're, we're roughly 50 days in. How are you, uh, how are you doing overall? Uh, overall, I have to say, you know, pretty well considering the circumstances, you know, we've been quarantined now for, like you said, for, for over a month, currently have my thrown adult daughter and her fiance living with us because they wanted to get out of Brooklyn. We're in North Jersey. So they wanted to get out of Brooklyn and, uh, we have them with us, but, uh, you know, knock on wood, we're feeling healthy and, and doing well and still uh, the company's still operating pretty well from uh, from a remote standpoint. As uh, someone who, who also lives in Brooklyn, I could say that was probably a good choice. <laughs> it's been a little, <laughs> a little Yeah, tense. for a period of time there, it was, uh, it was, looking, it was looking pretty uh, scary. So, so yeah. they made the decision to, to move in with us temporarily. It's all good. So, can you tell, um, just uh, to talk a minute about the Atkins companies and and a little rundown of, um, you know, what your what the specialty is and and you know some of the background. Sure, we're a third generation family real estate development company. As I said, we're based in West Orange, New Jersey. We've been in business now for over sixty years. Our father started the company back in the late fifties. Uh, through the course of history, we've done a lot of uh, development in various different real estate asset classes, ranging from residential, general office, retail. But for over 50 years, our niche has always been medical office. We have always owned and developed medical office properties through that time. Uh, and I would say about nine years ago, we as a company made a strategic decision to focus almost exclusively exclusively on the medical office market. So uh, we have divested ourselves of some of the other asset classes that we own. And now we own and manage about 700,000 feet of medical office properties across five states. And so, yeah, that gets to, you know, a, the, the reason I was interested to bring you on, which is just for this past, you know, a couple of months, we've been just in part of our regular coverage and in these podcasts been looking at how various sectors are in the industry being affected in different ways. thought it would be interesting to get this perspective on what it's been like in the medical office space. So um, like for one thing I understand is, you know, so on one hand you do have this heightened, you know, people like people that are COVID patients or services that are, that, that can help them in some ways, you know, maybe heightened operating with some heightened safety measures, but are but are, are continuing to be practicing what they're doing. But then on the flip side, you might have these other kinds of tenants who maybe doing procedures that people aren't having as much. So I'm kind of curious what the overall picture does look like. Well, you actually uh, nailed it pretty well there, David. <laughs> what, what we're seeing, you know, it's a pretty unique situation in our medical buildings because. As you said, you know, it runs the gamut of specialty types, mm -hmm. patient populations that our tenants deal with. So some of the practices, as you said, um, still need to operate and still need to see their patient base, uh, albeit on a very, very reduced patient load. And then we have some of the tenants who have closed altogether. I would say that's that's in the minority Mm -hmm. But there are certain types of practices that have felt the need to close entirely. 
So, you know, they're just trying to rough it out as best they can and hope to open up as soon as possible. Yeah, I know. Like, I mean, I have to go to an allergist um, every few weeks for allergy shots and I've continued to go, but it, you know, the, the experience of going is very different now. They kind of just like rush me, you know, come out, go out. When I get to the office, they just, I don't even go into the waiting room. They just bring me straight back into um, a room. I get my shots and I'm just in there. And then when I'm done, I'm done. And like, there's, and you know, the whole time we got face masks on and that kind of thing. So is that, is that sort of like typical of like what we're, of, 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 the, of, the, of the ones who are operating, what it's, what it is like right now? It's very typical. It's very typical. Early on, we made recommendations to our tenants uh, to alter some of the procedures in the way that they see their patients. For example, we had suggested to them to ask their patients to literally to wait in their cars until they were ready to be seen by the doctor. So they don't have a a waiting room full of people sitting next to one another. So that that has occurred with most of the uh, tenants who are still in operation. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those where you want to try to get them in and out as quickly as possible. In, in many of our buildings that have common lobbies, we've removed the furniture and so forth, sitting areas from, from the lobbies because we want to discourage loitering as much as possible. Mm-hmm. So it is all about getting them in to see their doctor and then getting them back out into their cars and on their way as quickly as possible. And as an owner, has that have you had to make other kind of operational, I mean, we're, that's what we're touching on right now, but have there been any other kinds of operational changes you've had to make in your portfolio? Physically, is that what you mean? That, yeah, that, or like, uh, you know, uh, maintenance schedules or um, cleaning schedules or is that, that stuff had to, have you had to kind of relook at any, look at how that stuff's being done too? Or? Ab- absolutely, ab- absolutely. From a, from a wellness and, and enhancing uh, the safety standpoint, we've mm-hmm. implemented several different programs. So as far as some of the work that we've done to enhance the cleaning of our buildings. We've stuffed up the frequency of our cleaning of the common areas and the tight touch points in each of the common areas of our buildings. Uh, We've also engaged a specialty cleaning service that provides a deep cleaning service, typically to the healthcare industry. They have come in and sanitized the the, uh, common areas, essentially with an electrostatic disinfection process that theoretically stays on the surfaces for up to 90 days and it specifically targets pathogens so the idea is that it will keep you know the surfaces in the common areas clean for for that period of time we have bought and installed self-cleaning elevator buttons for our elevators oh interesting the idea yeah it's a very interesting concept quite honestly we hadn't known about it but you know at the beginning of the crisis you know we tried to do as much research as we could and we found this available option where essentially it's an oxidation process huh. and it self cleans after somebody touches the button. So some of these things may seem like, you know, little items to do, but if you put them all together, the idea is to enhance, you know, the t- tenant and patient population base as much as possible. And that's clearly our first goal is to make it as safe as possible for everyone who enters the buildings. Yeah, though that elevator, I had not heard about that. That's very interesting. I mean, because I've thought about that too. You know, our office is in Midtown Manhattan. It's like a forty-story or so. You know, typical Midtown building. And I'm just been wondering what it's going to look like in terms of, you know, how they're going to manage elevator loads and and yeah, cleaning it. But if this is like maybe this will be something that we'll see everywhere. This this uh, yeah, these buttons. I think I think it will be. I think it's something you know, relatively uh, easy and inexpensive, and you know, potentially could be uh, a very important change going on in the future. On the real estate side of things, um, you know, with other sectors, there's varying levels of you know, like you know, we're just getting reports and both anecdotal and hard data around tenants needing some level of rent relief and then being and working with their landlords to, you know, just depending on their situation to figure it out, whether it's just a, simply an extension with no late fees or whether it's, 
we need to skip a month and we'll add it at the end, but just various um, options depending on the level of stress the tenant is facing. Is the medical, are you seeing, is that same kind of thing happening in, in your tenant base or is it a little bit um, less of an issue just given that you've probably got, you know, since you do have a, a, a chunk of, at least a, a pretty good chunk of tenants that are still operating? So as you said, uh, the, answer, the short answer to the question is yes. Uh, while we haven't seen it nearly to the extent of some of the as other asset classes like retail and so forth, you know, our tenants are not necessarily immune to cash flow issues right now, mm -hmm. uh, particularly the ones that we mentioned before that perform elective or non-essential type services. Uh, and those essentially are prohibited at the moment in most states, although just as an aside, we are hearing that that may ease uh, in the next week or so in, right. in several states. So that's an optimistic sign. But but yes, um, and again, it runs the gamut. You know, some of the larger systems, healthcare systems and so forth, uh, they seem to be okay. They're paying their rent. Some of the smaller, more independent practices, particularly the ones that have found themselves needing to close, they are the ones that have reached out and you know, where we have been able to work with them, we certainly do. Uh, it makes perfect sense for us to work with them because we've long known, and, and it's a hallmark, I believe, of, of our success that, you know, to work with our tenants, to listen to our tenants, to understand their needs and their long-term success, quite frankly, is our long-term success. So, you know, we are happy to to listen to their to their needs and, and, and if it, arises that we needed to do some short-term rent deferral, we have put that in place. And then on, you know, the other, another side of things is, is there anything happening now in terms of actually buying and selling of assets in the medical office space? So on a macro level, I would say yes. If for, for the deals that were in the pipeline and, mm -hmm. you know, we're on the verge of closing, most of those have closed. Uh, we are seeing, and most of the ones that, you know, are still in the pipeline and, you know, haven't yet closed, they're moving along, albeit more slowly and more cautiously. I would say any new deals, we're not seeing a whole lot of new deals coming across our desk at the moment. Um, and, and quite frankly, it's not the worst thing in the world because from our standpoint and from our investor standpoint, you know, the idea of trying to value properties during the midst of this crisis is, is a little bit more difficult. And so uh, I think most people are actually just focusing on maintaining their properties, getting through the crisis with their tenants. And as we see, you know, as we come out of the crisis, we fully expect the volume of, of activity to pick up. So, yeah, so, so it's, it's stuff that was already in the works is kind of happening but like you said so the new deal sourcing is that that there's not much happening right i mean for example we just closed uh, late last month on a sale of one of our properties that had been in the works for several months and the buyers were still anxious to close and it ultimately did close so you know that's been a fairly common occurrence that we've seen but as I said, for, for, for new pro product coming on the market, that has slowed tremendously. And you're getting much of a read from the debt side, from various lender types about how any changes in, in, in how they're approaching things, or is it kind of similar in that stuff? That well, I, I, yeah. yeah, I can tell you that a few things on the lending side for, mm -hmm. for the lenders that we deal with. Number one, They've been kind of inundated in the last few weeks with applications for loans. I'm sure you've heard a lot about, you know, the federal and state stimulus programs that are out there now, the PPP right. program and, and the like. So the banks literally are inundated with applications for that. So we've been working with, with them on some of our properties, you know, to the extent that they can devote the time to existing real estate properties and re real estate loans, they have been fairly cooperative in terms of working with 
their borrowers, uh, you know, on, on the same kind of thing as, as on the tenant side, with tenant relief, they have been working with us with short-term relief on the lending side. So when everybody sort of works together, mm -hmm. it's the best way to get through this crisis. And right. we've seen, we've been very successful with that up to this point. We'll see what the future brings. But I think everybody is fairly optimistic that the medical office space and the medical office asset class will be one of the first ones to recover uh, coming out of the crisis. So we're reasonably optimistic that, uh, you know, this asset class will rebound fairly, fairly well and, and will be a healthy class going forward. Yeah. I mean, that would seem to make sense because, uh, you know, some of things people may be able to, push off what they were going to do but i mean they're whatever they were going to do <laughs> like depending on the, the medical procedure like they're going to have to do it right, at, at some point i would think so um, you're exactly like right you're you're exactly right and we've had those conversations with many of our tenants where they believe they're actually going to be hit with a surge right of procedures and appointments because just as you said you know people with you know who have certain ailments and and need certain procedures, yes, they have put it off because, you know, it's been it's been a restriction, quite frankly, but it's not something they could put off forever. So so when those restrictions ease, a lot of these tenants feel like they're going to be hit with with quite a surge. And, you know, they're already looking into expanded hours, you know, late nights, mm. uh, weekends, because at the same time that they're going to be hit with, you know, a lot of the patient base back they don't want to fill up their waiting rooms like we talked about right. before. So it's right. going to be a juggling act for them to be yeah. able to see all the increased cases and at the same time, keep everybody's safety in mind. Yeah. That's going to be interesting. I, that's another thing I definitely not thought about, but like, right. Like you may, even if you are trying to serve the same number of patients or, or a slightly higher number, you're going to have to space them out over a bigger stretch of time because of these density concerns we're going to have for even when we go back to normal. So it's, I guess it's, it's probably going to be, be a juggling. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's going to be something like even on other property types too, like just maybe operating hours are going to be different for lots of things perhaps just so that we can... Uh, as a way of, of density control. There's no question about it. There's no question about it. Uh, depending on the different type of property and so forth, those are going to be considerations, certainly for the near term and, and probably, uh, you know, for the next year or and beyond. Those are going to be very big concerns. So is there anything um, that I didn't touch on that you'd like to, you know, highlight or, or, or discuss for, for the listeners? One of the things I, I think we could talk about is the type of medical office property that's out there now and okay. how it might shift in the future. Sure. Uh, the, so, trends, the trends, for example, we've been talking for a while now, and we have several properties in our portfolio that fit what we call the retailization okay. of healthcare, where Tenants are looking for uh, you know, more of a, uh, an exposure, you know, street and highway exposure. So they're li looking to more retail type properties where they can get branding, number one. First and foremost, they can get branding. Number two, they can have, you know, direct access for their patient base. Instead of going, you know, into a lobby and up an elevator and so forth, they can, go, they can walk from their car straight into their uh, tenant suite. So those are things that have been happening, you know, over the course of the last several years anyway. As I said, we have several properties that fit that criteria and the tenants obviously are, are very happy with, with, with the structure that they have. Now that, that being said, that doesn't fit the mold for everyone. And there are clearly medical tenants that like the idea of the traditional medical office building being surrounded by, you know, many other medical tenants. And, you know, I don't think that's going to go away. The, 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 the primary driver we see in the near future is still going to be the diversified, fully integrated medical building. But the reta this retailization that has been slowly occurring, we believe is going to accelerate 
because of the virus, because of this pandemic, uh, just because it inherently provides a safer, easier way uh, for pa patients to get in and out of the space without having to worry about, you know, being too close to other patients and staff and so forth. So do you see that as also coming out of this potentially an opportunity to buy assets that, that maybe used to be retail and reposition them as medical office? Is that, is that also something that will, that, that could happen? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So, uh, unfortunately what looks to be the reality is that there are going to be a certain percentage of the retail, you know, current retail users that, that may not be able to reopen after right. this crisis if they financially can't make it through. So there are going to be several, uh, opportunities out there for either the landlord, you know, the current owners of those properties mm -hmm. and or healthcare users to reposition those properties from formerly being a traditional retail user to a, a retail use to, to medical. There's no question about it. Yeah. Well, it certainly seems like I know that this cycle is ex obviously extraordinary in some way, well, in a lot of ways, just because of the, the magnitude of the shutdown and, you know, entire property sectors having to, having, having to be shut. But we're also, you know, this business is cyclical. And so some of the things that we've seen in the past of just, you know, once we get out of the acute period of crisis, then opportunities do emerge. And whether that's distressed assets or re repositioning, it's a, this has always been, at least in the time I've been covering a very creative industry in terms of, you know, taking these harder times and then creating the next growth cycle out of it. You're right. You're right. Uh, it's interesting to think about because, as you well know, you know, the old adage of location, 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 yeah. you know, is always the most important thing, thing for real estate, you know, location of real estate. But interestingly, that has evolved over the last batch of years that we are seeing for medical office. Typically, it used to be, you know, clustering around in and around on campus uh, around hospitals and in, you know, clustering of medical office buildings just in the immediate neighborhoods of, of the hospitals. That has been changing over the last several years as the healthcare systems have recognized the importance of sort of getting out and being in the community, the customer base that they serve. So we've been fairly successful in locating properties that fit that bill and working with healthcare systems that, that want to expand their footprint, so to speak. Uh, and again, it used to be in the old days, you know, a healthcare system had a monopoly on their sort of geographical footprint. That's not the case anymore. So you see hospitals competing against each other for, for similar patient base. So their footprints are expanding dramatically. And this crisis is really just going to further accelerate that process because there's going to be opportunities for the current properties that are going to lend themselves for, as we said, you know, repositioning to help these healthcare systems expand their footprint. Yeah. Well, so it seems, yeah. So for as confusing as things may seem now, we are, it seems like we're going to have a busy, a busy stretch ahead of us once, uh, once we get out of this. I agree that once we, once we get past the worst of this crisis, as I mentioned before, I believe that uh, the medical office sector is one of the asset classes that's best positioned to rebound and uh, possibly even uh, accelerate in terms of the amount of demand that may be necessary. So there may be an increased demand for either new class A space or, as we've just discussed, repositioning of existing uh, former retail properties to to be able to satisfy an anticipated enhanced demand. All right. Well, I appreciate you answering all these questions and shedding some real uh, deep insights on what's going on with the medical office sector. It's been my pleasure. And thank you to, for tuning in for, to this episode and we'll hope everybody is uh, means to stay safe and hopefully we're, you know, getting out into the real world safely in the near future. Absolutely. David, thank you so much for bringing Bob on. Bob, thank you so much. That was great insight. I have never 
uh, learned anything about the medical field when it comes to property. Uh, David's already been teaching me a whole lot <laughs> about investment <laughs> property, but thank you so much for being here because I learned a lot from you as well. And I, I wish blessings on you, your family business, and uh, that everybody will stay safe in your neck of the woods. And I know that David is staying safe where, where he's at. Again, I'm going to reiterate what David said. We hope every listener is staying safe and is able to get back to work as soon as possible and reconnect with friends and family. And to you, the listener, I want to thank you personally for listening to the Common Area Podcast with David Bodemer. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when David comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your colleagues. Thanks again for listening today. For everyone at NREI, this is Eric Johnson inviting you back in two weeks for all the stories that matter to you. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to the Common Area Podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of NREI or Informa. The content has been made available for information and educational purposes only.